Welcome to AHRQ's National Web Conference on Transforming Healthcare Through Patient-Generated Health Data Integration. Although a few people are still logging in, we are going to go ahead and get started on time. My name is Janie Xiao, and I will be moderating today's webinar. I currently serve as a health scientist administrator in the Division of Digital Healthcare Research, which is part of the Center for Evidence and Practice Improvement at HRQ. We are pleased to have with us today an esteemed group of presenters. They include Dr. Co Deborah Cohen from Oregon Health and Science University, Dr. Ida Singh from University of California, San Francisco, and Dr. Leslie Leonard from Medical University of South Carolina. This webinar is accredited by Affinity CE. If you are interested in receiving continuing education credit, or participating in this activity. Information on how to claim your credit will be presented at the end of this presentation. It will also be emailed to you after this webinar. For the purposes of accreditation, let me note that AHRQ, SD Solutions, Affinity CE, and the panelists have no financial interest to disclose. Also, please note that no commercial support was received for the development of this learning activity. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Deborah Cohen. Dr. Cohen is a professor and research vice chair in the Department of Family Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. She's a collaborative leader in qualitative and mixed methods primary care research. Dr. Cohen's research focuses on the evaluation and implementation of clinical innovations, including novel technological systems, assessing their impact on patient care, and understanding how to scale up successful transformation efforts. And now, allow me to turn the control over to Dr. Cohen. Thank you, Janie, and welcome, everyone. It's really um, my pleasure to be here. So on the next slide, you can see um, the objectives for my talk today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the findings and recommendations from an environmental scan related to patient-generated health data integration in ambulatory settings that was led by a colleague of ours, Ryan Sh Shaw, at Duke University and OHSU. I'm going to identify, and I'm going to identify some key areas of development and learning related to patient-generated health data integration. We developed a practical guide based on this scan and, and some of um, our, our advisors and our own pragmatic experience, and that work was led by Ocean's Dave Boston. And I'm hoping that at the end of my talk, um, you'll be able to identify the potential impact of integrating patient-generated health data in ambulatory settings, understand the state of the evidence, and maybe have some thoughts about how you might start thinking about doing that in your own settings. So you can find the full evidence report and also the, the toolkit that we developed at the two websites, at the ARC websites that are shown here, and you'll be able to get those later in the slideshow. So I want to talk a little bit about the methods that we used for this work. Um, for the environmental scan, we did a synthesis of peer-reviewed literature that built off and updated a review on this topic that was completed by Tiaze. We started, and this is Dr. Shaw's led this work, we started with a database of over 17,000 papers and identified and winnowed this down to about 325 full text articles that we assessed and ultimately 38, 36 that we included in the final synthesis. We also really dug into the gray literature, and, and part of the reason for that is this is a new area of, of research. So we and ARC were concerned that the peer review literature may not um, have everything that we were hoping for in it, and that there may be some other types of resources that could really inform our, our work. So we identified a variety of white papers and guides and resources that were published by the FDA, by ARC, by the Office of the National Coordinator, by the, by the American Medical Association and AMIA and others on this topic. And these topics covered 
um, a variety of aspects important, important to the selection, the integration, and the use of patient-generated health data in clinical care and ambulatory settings. Um, this included um, patient-generated health data and telehealth delivery models, strategic planning on creating a team, targeting patient populations, and creating value from patient-generated health data. And we, we blended that into our, our review. Um, we also conducted a survey of nine EHR vendors, to, um, and six completed the survey, and then five participated in an interview. And, and we really wanted to understand their perspectives on what they were developing and where patient-generated health data was going. And then we leveraged that environmental scan to inform the development of a practical guide. Um, o and OCHIN organized what, what is a user-friendly practical guide um, that outlines, um, and I'm going to walk you through it, some of the um, steps that an organization might consider taking or considering when approaching a new patient-generated health data implementation in their setting. And we had lots of feedback in all of these steps from a technical expert panel who um, informed our um, environmental scan and also informed the practical guide that we developed. So let me talk with you a little bit about the findings from the environmental scan. So we identified 36 peer-reviewed papers on integration of patient-generated health data. And there were really a few main types of patient-generated health data that were most common in the literature. Those included biometric data, um, collecting data via questionnaires, and health history. The most common um, condition that had been connected to the implementation, the collection and implementation of patient-generated health data was type 2 diabetes. And Apple Health Kit was one of the most common developer formats. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that when we talk about the practical guide. The themes that emerged from our review had to do with uh, uh, data authentication, resource requirements, patient technical support and training, data delivery to the EHR, data management, and, and also preferences um, for review. Um, we also looked at how to select and integrate patient-generated health data in ambulatory settings, and we looked into information about federal-level legislation, which governs data privacy and standardization reimbursement and regulation. So what we found is that um, there is growing evidence for patient-generated health data EHR integration, and this was also reflected in vendor feedback. Vendors reported partnering with institutions to level patient-generated health data to improve health outcomes and care coordination. HealthKit is commonly used due to its maturity, um, which provides data and security standardization. It's also a kit, which um, has a little bit more of an easier implementation than um, other doing this all from, from the ground up. Um, we found that few health systems and EHR vendors directly integrate with Google's Android platform. The use of interoperability standards such as HL7 and Fire is growing, and, and that's also helpful. And that we found that there's an investment, a commitment, and an understanding of the many variables that influence successful patient gener generation health, health data. And, and that is vital to being... Um, successful, which I think some of the other folks on this panel are going to talk about. So the, the practical guide built off some of the recommendations that we identified from the environmental scan. And here I'm just going to, I'm going to walk through these because um, there, there's, there's the research component of, of the value of and the utility of, of implementing patient and using patient-generated health data to improve outcomes. And, and then there's the practical piece of it, um, which is implementing it. And, and those two things are not totally separate. The more we implement and study our implementation, the more we can build a, a, a field of uh, knowledge, essentially. And that work needs to continue going hand in hand. But our task was to translate some of what we saw in the literature into a practical guide for implementation. 
And, and this was an area in the literature where there, there really is um, room for more, more work. Um, but the recommendations have to do with developing a strategy or blueprint for implementation, identifying champions and early adopters, tying patient-generated health data to a care delivery model, um, working on the workflow design or redesign, really having a patient-focused approach with a health equity lens from the start was, was a really important point. Um, leveraging a robust technology architecture, being sure to create data governance, um, making sure there's device guidance, um, providing guidance and education to stakeholders, and this is all, all stakeholders, implementing and adapting through iteration, and then evaluating against metrics and goals and, and planning for maintenance and scale, scaling, and providing technical support. So our team worked on developing a, a guide, um, which is called Integrating Patient-Generated Health Data into Electronic Health Records and Ambulatory Care Settings, a practical guide for, for folks who might be thinking about doing this in their own setting. And the guide is organized into six folios or chapters, essentially. And it touches on um, just an introduction to what patient-generated health data is and why it's important and then walks um, a potential user of the guide through some steps that may allow them to think through how to implement this in their, their own setting. Um, so, for example, um, just to point out in the introduction, each chapter um, offers an estimated reading time to the user, identifies key learning concepts, which in the introduction have to do with defining what patient-generated health data is, integrating patient-generated health data into the EHR, um, and, and how it can help with clinical decision support. It outlines some of the benefits of patient-generated health data, including increasing patient engagement and providing a fuller picture of health. Um, it ties this to an uptick in virtual care that we have seen um, as a result of COVID. And, and starts the conversation early about the importance of thinking about health equity in program planning from the start. Chapter two is a, is a, a, a sort of a how-to for assessing organizational readiness with regard to implementing patient-generated health data. And in this folio, um, unlike the first, also includes some activities, um, which includes an organizational readiness assessment um, some tools for gauging motivation, both from patients and organizational colleagues, and then starting to develop a roadmap for your own organization for what patient-generated health data implementation might look like. This is just an example of um, some of the, the things that an organization, um, some of the kinds of barriers an organization might experience with regard to patient-generated health data use and, and how they're, what some of the, the, the solutions might be. So, for example, um, lack of internet access comes up quite a bit. That's a very difficult one for an ambulatory setting to, to solve, but through community partnerships or hosting why, or helping patients find Wi-Fi hotspots, there may be some ways to, to solve those problems. And, and so the, the guide helps walk a user through some of the challenges and potential solutions. One of the things that is critical to patient-generated health data implementation is that this is not the kind of organizational change that, that one person can do alone. There probably are no organizational changes that one person can, can do alone. But part of what we talk about in the third folio is how to think about assembling the team. Who needs to be on it? Who are your likely champions? Um, we highlight the importance of having a coordinator, someone who can really coordinate and almost project manage the, the implementation process. And we, we talk about um, thinking about the external partners that can be very powerful allies. In, in implementation. And again, this is coupled with activities. So for example, we lay out in this chapter um, the some all of the different what might be some of the different roles on the team. So exa for example, there might be a quality reporting champion who um, is really helping um, 
think about um, making sure that the program meets implementation reporting requirements for regulatory programs, certificate certifications, alternative payment programs, um, and, and really making sure that it's aligned well with other things the organization cares about. There may also be an information tech, well, there will be an information technology champion who really knows how to consult on the technological aspects of the work, work with equipment vendors, assess bandwidth and equipment needs. There will be a lot of those um, needs on the, on the team and identifying someone who can lead and do that work becomes critical. The fourth chapter looks at decision making, um, choosing the best information technology for your um, patient generated health data implementation, thinking through myriad legal compliance security factors that really need to be considered ahead of implementation. For example, um, selecting devices for your program. You can talk with your EHR vendor to identify some of the best device options, which can narrow down the range of choices, which can be really helpful. You can test some sample devices to compare quality, cost, and usability. Um, and we point out that you don't necessarily have to do all of this yourselves. And, and some of our um, environmental scan work suggests that there are vendors that are thinking about this and they are furnishing patient-generated health data device kits that are tailored to specific clinical conditions. And, and that can make some of this easier for an organization if that's a viable option. Um, we spell out in a very simplified way what some of the different kinds of network connections are between a device and an EHR, um, just to help folks who may be very interested in this area but, but may not have all of the, the technical savvy at the, the start to understand how some of this might work in a very simple way. And then, of course, we turn to cost. Um, the, there's a number of important things to think about regarding um, startup developmental and ongoing costs of this program, it, this kind of a, a program's implementation. We, we developed this guide going into this hoping that implementation would be done in a way from the start that it would be sustained. So understanding the costs to grow and sustain implementation of patient-generated health data becomes important. And then we outline some of the um, help, we've developed an activity to help the user of the guide think about what some of the key financial reimbursement and reporting considerations to understand the costs and benefits of patient-generated health data might be in their own setting. And, and a big part of this is thinking about return on investment. So we introduce that con concept, but then we specifically dig into it in terms of patient-generated health data um, and what some of the indirect cost savings might be of a program like this. For example, fewer missed appointments. Patients may have better self-management on health outcomes. They may have more engagement in their own care and more retention in the practice. Um, there are a number of things that, that could be improved. And we, we end the guide with um, implementation, where we talk about just taking a step back and thinking about how to set realistic and measurable goals, how to engage the target groups of patients that you probably want involved in the start to make sure that you've got an implementation of patient-generated um, health data that's really aligned with patients' needs, how to develop a workflow to support staff engagement, um, and then what, what is helpful to learn before you scale your, the patient-generated health data implementation at your own site. Um, and this, again, is coupled with activities, um, many of which may be familiar to you, but we apply them to the patient-generated health um, implementation situation, such as setting SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, reasonable, and time-bound goals. And we offer some examples of what that might look like for uh, patient-generated health data implementation for, for patients living with hypertension. This work was possible because of a large group of, of collaborators, and, and here you can see them named. Um, they were both at Duke and OCHIN and OHSU, and we also had an incredibly wonderful technical expert panel. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. 
As a reminder, we will be taking questions after all presentations. So please submit any questions you have using the Q&A panel. Let's move on to our second webinar presenter, which is uh, Dr. Ida Singh. Dr. Singh is Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, Director of Digital Health for the Division of General Internal Medicine, and Co-Director of the new UCSF, UC Berkeley Joint Program in Computation Precision Health. Her research focuses on open integrated architectures for large-scale sharing of clinical trials and mobile health data. She's co-founder of Open M Health, a nonprofit organization that promotes open standards for mobile health data. She also co-developed Common Health, the Android equivalent of Apple Health, for bringing US CDI EHR data to smartphones. Dr. Singh is a recipient of the United States Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, a fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics, and is a practicing primary care physician. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Singh. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Xiao. And a uh, real pleasure to present to everybody on a topic that I think we're all super excited about. Um, and I'm happy to follow uh, uh, Dr. Cohen's presentation, which gave a great outline of how to think about uh, integrating uh, uh, patient-generated health data into a health system. I want to take that um, uh, presentation and go and, and add to it, complement it with the idea of individualized bouquets of PGD. And I uh, hope by the end of this uh, talk, you will understand why I have this, this metaphor. Um, the learning objective for this talk uh, is that you would identify key requirements for integrating patient reported outcomes into clinical care, and understand some of the key pain points in collection and governance um, uh, of PGHD, which I'll also call PGD, patient generated data, because, you know, what's health data and what's not health data, everything has some kind of health implication, so I generally call it PGD. And, um, and finally, to appreciate the benefits of a standards based uh, public utility approach to patient generated data. So I'm a primary care physician, and even for my sickest patients, I see them for about 20 minutes, uh, you know, every month, maybe. Um, and, you know, the question comes up, well, how do our patients really feel in between, uh, in between those visits? And the more we understand of that, uh, the more we can optimize our care for them. Um, so the approach would be to get patient reported outcomes, of course, uh, but getting them, you know, every three months or even every month just doesn't give us that, um, uh, that granularity of insight into how our patients really feel. And to, um, and, and to bring them into the, the care process, which they uh, partner with us on, right? We're partners with them, actually. Um, so one way to think about it is how PROs can be used. And we can think about the theory of planned behavior, where there are two complementary pathways for PROs to improve outcomes. Um, the one that we typically think of, the one that we typically build for is provide the PROs. It's really the bottom arrow here. The PROs help providers. And we use our, you know, patient reported outcomes to understand where our patients are, and we can guide them to behavior change, guide our treatment, and from that it improves outcomes. I would say, of course, that there's this other uh, pathway where patient reported outcomes are used by the patients themselves to self-monitor, to provide feedback, to increase self-efficacy, and they themselves can do their own behavior change and improve outcomes. And of course, both of these pathways are important. And I would submit that as we think about using patient reported outcomes, we really need to build for both of them and for both of them um, interacting with each other so that you know, this whole cycle um, is, is, uh, is, is facilitated. So that was the underlying hypothesis in our uh, MPROVE project, uh, which is funded by AHRQ. We're enrolling 40 English and Chinese speaking patients to track PROs on a uh, on a smartphone app um, over six months, and then these PRO results will be accessible uh, directly within the process of care. Um, UCSF is on the EPIC system, and so the idea would be that as the patient comes to see the doctor, they're in EPIC and, you know, just completely within the EPIC workflow, they can open up a dashboard uh, partnering with the bridge group, which is at UCSF, Department of Neurology, uh, to um, uh, to show the uh, the PRO data, you know, live completely within the workflow. 
I will say more about that later. On the app side, um, you can see these are just screenshots from the Improve app. And you can see that there's actually very prominent branding in the beginning around UCSF and a very prominent branding around um, my chart. And this was because we did a, a lot of um, uh, exploration with our patients and they felt that that was um, uh, a safe thing uh, and, and to build trust and to promote self-efficacy, a lot of our wording is geared towards um, uh, promoting self-efficacy. Many of our patients initially thought that they would give PROs to report to the doctor and then the doctor uses it and that was all the, that was the entire frame. Uh, and we really try to think, no, 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 this is something for you to take care of your own conditions as well. And that actually was actually um, uh, quite interesting that many people didn't think that and didn't see that and was quite a hard, hard thing for them to say, wait, wait, you know, I'm supposed to use this. Uh, so it's really, really quite interesting. So our wording was promoting self, uh, self-efficacy. Um, which, as you see here, a self-management with PRO tracking, um, with faces to see how they're doing, uh, and a graph, this one's obviously made up, um, about how they're doing over, over time. So supporting, uh, as in the theory of applied behavior, both the provider pathway and also the patient pathway. For the uh, provider pathway, we do, uh, you know, integrate the data back into the workflow, as I said. So, for example, if in between clinic patient visits a patient is reporting PROs and it exceeds a clinical threshold, then that patient, uh, the provider gets a staff message. So that's a typical way that we get data in through our care process. It's not a new process at all. It just comes up at yet another inbox message. Um, for example, here, you know, Ms. Chan's GAD score, GAD7 score is, is over the threshold. I get a note and I can just click on this, um, uh, you know, on a link again within Epic and up pops, the, uh, up pops the dashboard. So very seamless, uh, making as few steps as possible, no separate logins, you know, no separate website, any of that stuff, okay? So uh, that integration is, is, I think, absolutely critical uh, for these types of decision support systems to, to be used. Um, it also needs to integrate into the actual visit workflow. So if I'm seeing a patient either in person or telehealth or in a telephone encounter, um, I can actually access the bridge dashboard through these tabs on the top. Many of you are familiar with it. Um, if I'm seeing that patient, you know, I have a sort of back channel text uh, system called Volt with my care providers. Uh, so we, with our, with our care team, and so I can get a text to remind, hey, you know, your patient has entered patient reported outcomes, you know, go look at it uh, on bridge. And that's really important. We've heard from patients that if I'm filling this stuff out, I want my docs to see it and I want them to respond to it. It's, it's, almost, it's just courtesy, really. Uh, and so it's really critical that if you're gonna ask patients to enter data, that you make it easy for the providers to see that data uh, and, to, and, and to get value out of it, right? That's, that's really incumbent upon us. So some reflections from the whole IMPROVE project. Clearly patient reported outcomes are of huge interest. Um, I'm seeing so many, 385 attendees right now. Uh, that's, really, that's really great. A tremendous interest. Um, the health system is interested uh, at BCSF. All our clinics are interested. Um, both the general uh, clinics like mine, mine and uh, primary care, but also certainly condition specific PROs for oncology, for you know, uh, uh, physical rehab, for example, you, know, you, you can imagine many others. So how does it all come together, right? Um, for the patients, we need to facilitate longitudinal collection of patient reported outcomes as well. Um, you know, Cause it's that trend over time that's really important. As people get sicker, they get better. Um, PROs, however, need to be useful, I think to the patient first and foremost, because they're the ones you know, reporting on this, they're the ones who are going to put in the work. Um, so it should be useful to them uh, in a way that they can see. Uh, so clear purpose, it's got to be relevant to them, and it should be concordant with their language and, and sort of, you know, their cultural and health literacy background, which is, you know, it is a tall order, but I think it's something that we, we absolutely should do. On the provider and uh, institutional side, workflow integration is important. Um, the workflow that I uh, just sort of briefly went over uh, is based on fire APIs and smart on fire protocols. 
those are now standard, of course, across uh, the, the major EHR vendors and, and others. And so really should be able to be uh, portable between different systems, but that's, that's uh, you know, I think still very, very challenging, right? And, uh, and, and as Dr. Cohen said, using pre-existing workflows, really thinking about uh, implementation, uh, it's super, super important. And in these COVID times, absolutely need to minimize the impact on our clinical staff at UCSF in the last five years, the number of our in-basket messages has gone up fourfold. Uh, it, it, we're just being inundated. And so we cannot have, you know, data just sort of flowing to us, you know, any more than is absolutely necessary and very, very high value. So these were the reflections from our project. And, you know, we're, we're um, about to uh, do our, 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 uh, our pilot study before we do our, our full type, uh, type 2 implementation study. Um, but if it even if it is uh, successful at the end, it will be a one off solution. Um, and, and I think we have to stop building one off solutions uh, because we all know there's a fantastic opportunity here for patient generated data. It is a remote window into patient health states and that remote window, um, you know, has both patient reported outcomes, your standard sort of promise type instruments, right? Your ecological momentary assessments. There are also uh, home devices, as we all know, the cuffs, the kilometers, the wearables, you know, there can be so many other new stuff coming. There's internet of uh, things, sensors, and even things that we used to think were patient reported outcomes, right? Like maybe your mood, you know, we've got Amazon Halo that's actually sensing it. Um, things that we normally think of as being sensed, like a blood pressure. Well, sometimes you can't get at your blood pressure, um, you know, or it's not um, wireless or the connection's not working, and then I might report it manually. So I think we need to think about sort of PROs, sort of traditional PROs and sort of, you know, passive sensing and, and active report. They're really the same thing. They're just windows into our patient health states. And of course, with the, you know, all the new devices that are coming out, it's like a thousand flowers blooming, right? Uh, and which is great, it's, it's beautiful, but it's also allergy inducing. Um, and so the question is, how, how do we get from the thousand flowers blooming to where we wanna go? And I would suggest that where we wanna go is a bouquet of flowers, uh, a pleasingly uh, arranged, uh, you know, uh, 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 a combination of, of flowers that are right for, uh, for a particular person and a particular need which means that there's not just one bouquet for UCSF, there's not just one bouquet for primary care, there's a bouquet for every single patient. There is a different bouquet for each patient over time. They may be having surgery, they may have cancer, and then they recover from cancer, and then they get heart disease, and then they get better. There's gonna be mix and match of the sensors and the data that's gonna be relevant for that patient that differs patient to patient and differs over time. So we need to have individualized bouquets and we should, you know, not aim for anything less. So what are the pain points to, to get there? Um, first, and I'll break these into three. First is technical and governance from the health system perspective, and we certainly see this. Multiple projects are rebuilding the same PGD ingestion and storage infrastructure. I think you saw that uh, diagram in, 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 uh, in, in Deborah's talk, you know, with boxes and lines and APIs and everybody's building the same thing over and over again, lots of security costs and quality downsides. And it, it's really hard to govern that. Uh, we have a whole process for governing it, uh, but it, it's fragmented. Um, it's not the most efficient. And I would say, you know, not the safest. Um, patient trust, I think, is a huge issue. Uh, when a health system is having different clinics collect different data using different sensors from the same patient, uh, and there's doesn't seem like the system as a whole understands what we're asking for the patients, um, that that starts to undermine patient trust. You know, do you really know what you're doing, right? <laughs> the patient might ask. Um, and then on the on the discovery side, you know, we all want to do precision medicine. We all would love to have a learning health system. And the heterogeneity of how we collect our data, format it, how we consent it, uh, makes it really hard to use it at scale. And of course, as we duplicate and have heterogeneity of end user systems, you know, of a bridge dashboard or some other decision support system, the more that's a cacophony, it's going to impede how we actually help patients at the front line and how we help our patients as well on their front line. So there are a lot of pain points. Um, and, and, you know, one response to this, well, 
you know, we're all on, on an electronic health record. Um, many, many are on Epic, you may be on Cerner. Um, there are lots of pros to that, right? Uh, certainly from our side, we've learned that makes a lot of sense because the Med Center has full control. There are lower security risks. Uh, you have a, you know, a smaller surface area of risk. All clinical units use the same approach. So, you know, if we're getting blood pressure, uh, then it's the, the renal clinic, you know, cardiology, primary care, we're all using the same thing, okay? Uh, remote data is stored in EPIC, which is important because uh, that's uh, necessary for billing. Uh, clinicians can see remote and clinical captured data together. It's all within EPIC. It's device agnostic, right? Uh, there is actually a way to integrate HealthKit and Google Fit in. Um, fascinating to see that, you know, uh, the use of Google Fit is, is not quite as big um, for various uh, technical reasons. And um, for the patients, and you know, my chart is a trusted one-stop shop. Um, we've heard that over and over again. If it comes through my chart, I, you know, I, I know what that is. I know how to work with it. Um, I, I'm happy with that. There are, of course, a lot of cons. My chart is not that user-friendly. And while, you know, I, I would say over 80% of our patients are now on my chart, you know, that's just nominally they've signed in on my chart. It's still very challenging to use. And this is just speaking about, uh, about the EPIC uh, version, of course, the EPIC uh, patient portal. Um, uh, my chart does not support character-based languages like Chinese, which in a place like San Francisco is actually really important. Um, Android patients are not well supported. Uh, and that's a real problem because the demographics of those who are on Apple versus those on Google, there's a disparity there. Um, and, and I think just supporting Apple users really leaves uh, some of our, you know, less, uh, um, uh, uh, more marginalized communities um, by the wayside. For an academic medical center like UCSF, it's also hard to think through how we fit in digital health research like grants funded by AHRQ. Um, it's restricted to using only EPIC's decision support tools. Uh, you have to use EPIC's user interface. Um, it uh, you know, only restricts you to using both health, either HealthKit or Google Fit, um, which you know, may be okay, but there are a lot of constraints, and we can talk about that later for those who are interested. And my chart does not support patient-facing data-driven decision support. It really supports just sort of that bottom pathway in our theory of planned behavior. It's all about how do we help the provider, you know, do their job. It really isn't thinking that that much, um, certainly not in terms of using patient-generated data to help support patients in their health care in a, in a granular fashion. So many pros, some cons. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, we just want to get there. We just want to get to the small individualized bouquet uh, for uh, diverse users. And I, I think what um, I would like to focus on is actually the arrow that, that goes from here to there. Um, that arrow needs to include both technical and governance components. Uh, technology and governance need to go hand in hand in, in this type of work. Um, and it must allow us to build these individualized bouquets easily so that we can achieve that sort of promise of precision digital health. So how do we do this? Uh, the Commons Project is a nonprofit public trust that's established to build digital services that put people first. Uh, what does that mean? It is a fourth sector organization, i.e. it's not a for-profit, it's not a governmental thing, and it's not your traditional nonprofit that sort of, you know, relies on your generosity during a pledge break. It is a, what we think of as a for-benefit corporation, uh, corporation, and it's a for-benefit and it built, and it, it's, um, uh, it's, its job here is to build and operate uh, a public utility. Uh, we're calling this PGD as a service, don't have a name for it quite yet, uh, but I want to step, step you through what we think of as a public utility. So um, uh, I've worked with TCP to build Common Health, which is the Android equivalent of Apple Health, so that you can use, if you're an Android user, you can download Common Health right now from the App Store, and you can um, sign in to your, uh, your uh, health system. Um, UCSF is one of them, over 350. Uh, uh, health systems are, are on Common Health, including LabCorp and Quest and you know, the VA and so forth. Um, so you can bring your electronic health record data onto your phone, your or Android smartphone, and it's governed under this thing called the Common Trust Network. Um, and then that allows you, there's a little uh, module within uh, Common uh, Health that you can then pull sensor data, like um, blood pressure data, into this standardized open public aggregator which then can serve up that data using official open standards, open in health amongst others, uh, to a, a number of clients. 
Um, so at UCSF, for example, this can be used to pull in blood pressure data into our bridge dashboard. So uh, what this does is it serves the whole ecosystem. Um, uh, actually, I do need to say that uh, the, way, the way it also works is there's a deep link which allows the user to initiate this data flow um, very simply using just, uh, just a link. And I, I believe uh, uh, Dr. Leonard's going to talk about deep links more in the next in the next talk, but it makes it really simple so that patients don't have to sign into Common Health and then sign into the aggregator and sign into MyChart um, and also sign into Omron, which is kind of the earlier approach. It just was not going to work. Uh, so we sort of came up with this thing. And what this does is it serves the whole ecosystem. It is, doesn't serve only one disease. It's not just for diabetes. It doesn't serve just one clinic. It doesn't even serve just one institution. It serves the whole ecosystem. And I think that's what we need to scale the kind of um, trusted, usable, patient-generated data that we need. So in summary, uh, PROs for multiple chronic conditions need to be useful first and foremost for the patient, uh, that this, uh, the technology uh, uh, we have now, standards-based smart on fire technology to integrate into the workflow, but we really do need to be thinking about individualized combinations for each patient that's customizable to them over time as they get better and worse from their multiple chronic conditions. And that we also need at the same time to be thinking about simplicity and, and, um, and safety for governance and management of the PGD collection uh, as, as we go forward. So uh, thinking, uh, we're working on a pu public digital utility model that's standard space that can anchor this modular, flexible, trustworthy ecosystem. Thank you. And I do want to thank um, many people that uh, have worked on this from TCP, from uh, uh, General Internal Medicine, and from Bridge, and happy to take questions during the discussion period. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Please feel free to submit any questions you have using the Q&A panel at this time. So moving on to our final presentation of this webinar, which is being led by Dr. Leslie Leonard. Dr. Leonard is based at the Medical University of South Carolina, where he holds many roles. He's assistant provost for data science, smart state chair in healthcare quality informatics, associate director of the South Carolina Translational Research Institute, and director of the Biomedical Informatics Center. He's also vice president and chief medical officer for Health Sciences South Carolina working to improve the health of South Carolinians through health information exchange. Dr. Leonard was the founding director of the National Center for Public Health Informatics at CDC and is currently the public health representative to the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technologies High-Tech Advisory Committee. And now I'd like to turn the control over to Dr. Leonard. We've given it once before. Well, this is a fun talk. We've given it once before. Um, but what's fun about this is starting at a very high level and then moving uh, to an intermediate representation. And then I'm going to go down a little bit into the weeds as to how one actually does these things and, and how uh, one uh, generates uh, uh, patient data or patient entered data and those different things. And uh, I think that this will be interesting for those of you who um, are really on the front lines and wondering how you can actually bring this up quickly and make a difference with your own organization. So, um, hmm, there we go. So we're gonna go through some of our, uh, these questions, you know, uh, how do we initiate uh, uh, PGHD streams? How do we configure them? What are the security issues? What are the sort of analysis and summarization issues? And then reintegration in clinical workflows. Uh, all of these are critical. I think they were all called out in that AHRQ document, uh, which you know kind of gives you the macro view of the processes. And I'm gonna spiral in on a couple of applications here that uh, go through this. So uh, as we've heard before, uh, pluses and minuses, there are EHR resources uh, to, uh, uh, patient-generated health data. And one of the resources I'll talk about um, that I didn't talk about previously is captive or kiosk mode interfaces for patient-generated health data. We'll also talk about tethered portals, smart on fire, and uh, deep linkage uh, as tools to uh, set up two-way communications with apps and other things like that. And I'll give you examples of all of those as we go forward. 
But first, I want to start with this idea that there are some uh, patient-generated health data that are so confidential that um, we uh, want to collect these in healthcare environments that are highly controlled. And so in our HRQ R18 grant, we're screening uh, our um, uh, patient population of primary care patients for intimate partner violence uh, uh, risk and assessing uh, the degree of risk and helping manage their future care. And we chose not to do this through my chart or through a, uh, uh, an, an app because there might be times where the use of this uh, remotely uh, could endanger the patient, that the person who was abusing them could discover they were reporting on their risk. So what we wanted to do was to screen people interactively um, between visits. And again, what we wanted to do with this was not just um, have the nurse collect this data because sometimes that um, removes the self-reported aspects of this and that the uh, uh, the person who's perpetrating the violence might be in the room, but separate the person from any uh, family members who might be uh, the provocateurs of the risk and then uh, to allow them to use the uh, uh, computer in the room to be able to generate patient reported health data. So that's what we do. Um, we uh, have a, a best practice alert that uh, reminds people to uh, initiate screening of patients uh, once a year in our at-risk groups, and that that then moves them to this lock screen VPA that is brought up between the rooming of the patient and the provider visit. So at this point, the, uh, the uh, uh, exam room computer becomes a patient's device. They can't really go anywhere or do anything else with that. The, uh, they enter uh, the symptoms they're experiencing, they, uh, and if there are any positive symptoms, we go into a more detailed assessment. And then uh, uh, a best practice alert, if there's any positive uh, um, environments, another alert brings the provider back uh, to the report of the data, uh, and that uh, then they can fill out confidential documentation uh, of this during the visit, where they uh, look at the assessment and generate a plan for caring for this patient and uh, move activities forward. Now, we've been rolling this out in a stepped wedge design across our entire practice uh, by 24 clinics, and that uh, um, I would say this is a difficult workflow to implement it, uh, because we have different uh, approaches to uh, um, having patient-generated uh, healthcare data in the clinic. Some of this interview-based, other things like that. But um, as you can see, there are some clinics in our mix that uh, have very high compliance rates with this, and there are some that have some issues, and that we average overall around 40%, uh, 35, 40% compliance with this particular workflow, even though it's very difficult. And just to summarize again, that this is a, uh, you know, uh, lock the computer screen after the uh, MA uh, visit in the room to gather vital signs, uh, allow remove anybody else from the room, allow the patient to use the computer screen on their own, and then uh, have this information conveyed directly to the provider uh, when they're uh, 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 during the visit so they can develop a plan to respond to this and to move forward. Uh, but even with this degree of difficulty, it is practical to do this kind of, of uh, screening, and this greatly increases the screening for um, uh, intimate partner violence in our clinic particularly also just beyond the screening, going to the management aspects of that and, and truly making it part of the primary care process. Um, tethered examples in EPIC, uh, again, that we heard a lot of the obstacles for using it. It will remain uh, an integral part of uh, most applications. It was definitely how we rolled out applications for uh, COVID-19 when we had to do this uh, in a rapid way that would, um, you know, get, uh, uh, tools for monitoring patients into as many hands as possible as quickly. I think the two critical components of this is there is a registry of all the eligible patients uh, in the EHR, uh, and that uh, this registry is what brings people to the portal, uh, and mobile messages are generated from that, and then the, that uh, they see an application questionnaire, it comes back into the EHR, uh, often as a flow sheet, and that uh, triggers the routine workflow that people have. So this is um, our COVID-19 example. We've used this in about 2,000 patients um, that uh, uh, after uh, testing or a, uh, screening of the patient uh, in a uh, uh, 
uh, telehealth visit, uh, a nurse does an assessment of the risk of uh, an individual patient based on their current presentation and the symptoms that they're having. And then um, they can use this to prescribe uh, uh, the app uh, through my chart to patients. And that uh, then they uh, will get a reminder daily of a questionnaire uh, that uh, um, goes through and screens them using uh, uh, a, a PRO measure that's been documented uh, in pneumonia. And then uh, they submit this, and then this goes uh, into the workflow, uh, into the, the inbox uh, when there's a change, uh, into a flow sheet, and uh, uh, then uh, triggers the nurse to be able to call them and do an assessment, and then to write a note about their progress. Uh, so it provides a, a pretty uh, integrated workflow to dealing with this one issue. It's not exactly of okay, it's just one flower, but um, sometimes that's better on Valentine's Day. We, we, uh, uh, for this particular application, the, the idea is that we're able to rapidly complete a single workflow uh, that's completely integrated with care. And this goes on for most of our patients for about a week until their COVID symptoms begin to clear. And that uh, it's been very successful in this environment to get people uh, into our emergency departments early without uh, overburdening those departments. Um, uh, as you can see, we published a couple of papers on this and that uh, um, I'd refer you to these to get additional details about uh, our uh, um, uh, uh, implementation and uh, successes we've seen with that. Um, we'd like to customize this kind of workflow where an app is prescribed in clinic uh, to the uh, um, you know, to other apps to allow us to create that bouquet of flowers that uh, uh, Dr. Sim mentioned uh, and to move beyond the, you know, a single focused uh, application area. Um, so again, we, we sort of see the same uh, issues is that we see the EHR is initiating the workflow management, that you prescribe the app as an order similar to what we prescribed for uh, the, uh, um, uh, with the, our COVID monitoring practice. And, but we, now we are going to use an API uh, to configure uh, the app and then to work with that. And then um, in, in general, there's a question as to how you get the data back in now. Either you can trust uh, the app itself to communicate uh, back to the EHR, which uh, um, it can be problematic because you're essentially opening an API to the world that can write back into the EHR, or you can use a cloud uh, application to store and summarize the device and create a trusted partner that could then come back in through uh, gateways or through fire uh, APIs when they learn to write back into the EHR. And so uh, we found that this uh, workflow was important. Um, so again, um, the way that we built this was, uh, and this is really a test example that we're describing here, uh, is uh, to take the same uh, interface we were using, convert it to a smart on fire application. And then we create a deep linkage for patients uh, so that they don't have to log back into their MyChart account. But, and I'll show you what a deep linkage is, but essentially they click on a link that they get on their cell phone and then this will automatically download the data that's required to prescribe and uh, configure the app. It will give them an encrypted identifier to report back with, and that uh, uh, it will also uh, uh, drive the questionnaires that are administered in the app. And so these kinds of configuration tools and uh, um, uh, anonymous data linkage tools are, are often useful. Um, so what is a deep linkage? A deep linkage is a URL, a URL that uh, uh, triggers an operating system level function to move a person from a browsing website uh, to uh, uh, view an app in the same uh, state. And so you have the website, you have a web page with some content in it, you have a deep link, and then you move to the app in the same state. So it's kind of like how you got from the McDonald's uh, website to the McDonald's app for and takes you into the app for ordering a burger. Um, we use the same uh, approach to be able to uh, send information between the EHR and an app, uh, and uh, that uh, we uh, configure the app using this. So to kind of show you one of these diagrams that's more difficult, again, we have our gateway, we send a SMS URL to the phone, the phone then with the deep link, it goes to a database where um, 
there's an access token and an app configuration uh, as well as an encrypted identifier. And then that's uh, forwarded to the app uh, and then the, the app can uh, receive the appropriate configuration and uh, uh, turn off the deep linkage. So the way that we've used this uh, in a grant that we had with Tatric uh, for surge capacity was to be able to prescribe home monitoring devices of different types and to avoid having to do the Bluetooth linkage to the uh, monitoring devices uh, because we already knew the device that was being prescribed and its parameters and uh, potentially its identity even and were able to enter that in clinic and that way when the patient turned on the device and connected it to our app, it would just work. And that, uh, uh, so th that's kind of what you see here uh, with pulse oximeters of different types or uh, different applications where, that are with that. We also use this as a tool to help us be able to filter data. So the, the idea is, is, is that if you have a large amount of data coming in from, an, from a sensor like a blood, continuous blood pressure monitor or a, uh, um, a ECG or a pulse oximeter, that's more data than you'd like to integrate in Epic and it's noisy, uh, uh, data that you'd like to filter. So um, what we did was we created an approach for uh, allowing someone to send this to Azure uh, or any other cloud resource where it could be filtered, summarized, alerted, and then um, because the client in Azure was trusted, we could then reintegrate that back into the EHR and then back into the EHR's uh, workflow uh, represented here by that flow sheet, which sort of shows the records changing over time. So. Again, deep linkages are a useful tool that allows us to do a lot of the um, uh, uh, plumbing work for uh, interoperability and communications behind the scenes and allows us to rapidly be able to uh, um, uh, deploy apps with the minimum number of clicks by the, uh, by the user, which can help address some of the issues, again, that have been raised about this, about uh, um, reducing the uh, uh, difficulty of use by users uh, and other things uh, by the patient user to it, it becomes a, a more seamless process. Last I'd like to talk a little bit about what we've done with our uh, in our DNA SE recruitment. Uh, in our DNA is a precision medicine uh, research uh, project that uh, will recruit uh, 100,000 South Carolinians and that uh, we've been managing that again through deep linkages. Um, here, what we're doing is actually uh, using the same approach to deep linkage that we have, except that uh, uh, we're integrating REDCap uh, and that uh, we're bringing trial registration and test ordering uh, back into our EPIC system. And the reason that I'm kind of excited about this is that REDCap is a phenomenal place to be able to do um, um, PRO uh, questionnaires and to manage PRO questionnaires, including adaptive questionnaires. And so, uh, using the same architecture that we've created with deep linkages, we hope to be able to uh, demonstrate how PROMISE uh, questionnaires can be administered and then brought back into uh, uh, EPIC in the same sort of uh, way. But for right now, what we're doing is just allowing this to have someone to use a deep linkage to um, go to a consent website, enroll, and then register and have tests ordered for them for our um, uh, um, for our precision medicine uh, research project. So that kind of sums up the uh, uh, activities here. Tethered systems are very practical and capable. Kiosk mode is, is actually very good for confidential uh, PGHD. Uh, workflow integration is much easier with tethered systems, so if you need to build something fast. Um, app gateways uh, require some infrastructure, and SMFP linkages add capability and simplicity to uh, um, different types of apps. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leonard. And um, thank you to all of our present presenters for their very informative presentations. As a reminder, please submit any questions you have for our presenters using the Q&A panel. This concludes the content portion of the webinar. Now we have a few minutes left for questions. Although we may not be able to get to them all today, we will provide responses to all questions in writing. You will receive an email once these responses are available. So I have a question for all the presenters. Um, would you be able to share a story, a short story, 
on how and where PGHD made a difference. So including some information like what type of data were collected and which organization or people were in influenced by the PGHD. So um, Deb, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I was in the position of working with a team who was implementing and studying the implementation of at-home blood pressure screening for patients who had a diagnosis of hypertension. Um, and patients were um, recording those screenings in a portal, and then they were input, pulled into the EHR, and they were able to view the in-clinic and at-home blood pressure screenings over the course of a month. And the doctor and the patient could see how that was aligned with medication treatment management. And what was really cool about this is um, we were able to record the doctor-patient dialogue, both of uh, the video of the screen use and how the visualization tool was described and also the conversation. And, and what was striking about that is um, how empowered patients were to come into that visit and discuss their blood pressure readings, the highs and the lows, how helpful it was in um, identifying if there might be some white coat syndrome, patients who tended to have a higher blood pressure in clinic reading than they were getting at home, and how it opened up a dialogue both about um, blood pressures that weren't controlled, where treatments, medication treatment needed to be modified, and also conversations about where at home blood pressures were a little bit lower than expected. And the physician could check in about were there any other symptoms? Was the patient getting dizzy when they stood up? That kind of thing. So it was really helpful. Um, the thing I will note is that I'm, I'm not sure that this needed to be done forever, right? A short um, time frame for this kind of um, a, a need provided a lot of insight um, into what was going on at home with the patient's hypertension management. I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, Ida? Yeah, let me give maybe uh, somewhat surprisingly maybe a contrarian view. Um, uh, the story that we uh, that Deb just shared of of the blood pressure, you know, absolutely, uh, so much value there. Uh, truth be told, we've been doing this all along, right? I have patients who are um, elderly Chinese speaking patients, uh, very technically not uh, not terribly sophisticated in terms of you know using wireless blood pressure cuffs or anything, um, but for you know decades now, they've been coming in and sharing their home blood pressure data with me. Uh, that's patient generated data. They check their own blood pressure. They come in with, you know, very nicely uh, laid out graphs, some of them even. Um, and we sit in and we have that discussion uh, that, that Deb explained. So, you know, it isn't, I, I think we use this data all the time. Um, uh, we just, uh, um, uh, it, it's, not, it's not a new thing. It's just that we need to be able to um, bring it into our systems, we need to scale it, and we need to support it, and then we need to turn around and make better use of it, um, you know, to aggregate that data for machine learning, um, you know, to bring it in together with other data streams uh, so that we can have, you know, more robust prediction or more robust decision support. But I think that the value of it itself and how it gets integrated into the care, we actually have, have done that. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to build on. Thank you. Lastly? Yeah. Um, two examples were given in the talk already. Uh, screening for intimate partner violence uh, in clinic. We're identifying patients who are at risk. We're managing those uh, in clinic uh, using this approach uh, in our AHRQ funding grant. Uh, second, uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, Again, we, uh, there are limited uh, home telehealth uh, resources to follow patients. We're able to set up an efficient workflow to allow patients to complete questionnaires, uh, screening uh, their uh, uh, level of symptoms, particularly you know, how far they can walk and uh, the, the coughing they have and shortness of breath, and that uh, um, be able to use that to direct our uh, uh, COVID 
19 remote care resources to those patients who need it most and uh, need the, the closest monitoring. So uh, very, uh, very clear sorts of uh, issues with that. Um, I think the, you know, I've been in other projects where we've used uh, telehealth uh, systems for uh, glucose data and other things to report to patients and that, uh, again, it, it's, uh, it does require a system and you have to be planning to work with the patient on how you're making changes to their care for it to have impact. Thank you. My next question um, is also for all of the panelists. Um, so are there partnership opportunities that you have heard or you have seen for nonprofit organizations um, who are interested in implementation? Um, so, yeah, very broad question. I'm not sure I can give a, a general answer. There's so many components all up and down the chain, um, you know, to working with communities. I think, I think um, one of the things I think really needs help is increasing the the capacity to, uh, of the communities, especially our more marginalized ones. I'm looking at the questions, you know, our elderly patients or ones who don't speak um, English. Um, you know, we can't leave it up to the distress nursing staff to support them to debug their connection, you know, to call their their kid for the password, right? That that's sort of what it comes down to. Um, I don't think it can be up to the primary care physicians uh, or physicians at all, or maybe even the health institutions. Maybe this is something that should be a community-based um, activity to, to increase uh, sort of digital literacy capacity. And um, I, I think that's, that's one area where I would like to see partnership with, uh, with nonprofits, just as an example. Um, we'd be delighted to work with not-for-profits on a low-cost solution to use REDCap uh, for, uh, uh, in combination with uh, a, an open source API uh, and deep linkages to be able to collect uh, uh, patient-generated healthcare data using uh, PRO measures, uh, particularly the promise measures and the adaptive promise measures. So anybody who uh, is interested in partnering with us on those types of ideas or who wants to use uh, our intimate partner violence uh, screening tools for EPIC, uh, or our uh, tools for uh, 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 remote management of COVID-19 patients, uh, we are would be excited to partner with you. Thank you. Deb, would you like to add anything? I, no, I don't have anything to add to this one. I think Leslie okay. and I covered it. Okay. So the next question um, is for um, Ida and uh, Leslie. So. What process did your organization undergo in determining which PRO or PGHD vendor to use for data collection? Survival um, of the fittest. <laughs> I, I, I don't uh, have insight into exactly the process, uh, but it was, I'll, I'll tell you how it, uh, who did it maybe is, is an important question uh, to, to um, the vendor for integrating blood pressures data into our health system was uh, a process that was run by our population health department. Um, and it was done very much thinking about sort of how do we meet our ACO goals and so forth. There was an uh, actually other initiatives that were being started by, you know, by, by the Reno department, by us in general medicine, there were umpteen other researchers who were also thinking about it. Um, and I know that they did go with the vendor and then actually the health system itself had a, uh, a sort of built in, uh, you know, system where we developed it from the ground up. So the answer was, it was, you know, everybody did something like separately uh, and then kind of all at the same time. <laughs> That's probably the basic, <laughs> the, the, the big picture of how we approached it at least. At least back then, I think we're getting much better because we've learned from that process, you know, what is efficient and what isn't. But I think it's this governance issue of who even decides what PROs we're going to collect, right? Who decides what, you know, patient-generated data and who gets to use it and so who needs to be part of the uh, part of the planning. I think those are things that we're, we're learning. I think you've aptly expressed what I meant by survival of the fittest. That the, <laughs> yeah. uh, the point was is that you're in a world where each service line or each, uh, um, you know, di different uh, people in the organization, the chief digital officer, CMIO, uh, 
other groups all believe that they have the right to manage their own patients as best as possible with the best data sources that there are available. And um, oftentimes there are people who uh, want to, uh, um, you know, minimize the cost to their particular uh, branch of the organization um, in the short term and get the highest functionality in the short term without a global approach. This is a great place for CMIOs and for uh, CIOs to help coordinate and to say, we've got to slow down a little bit in different places so we can all advance together. And that uh, that's critically important in this. But in the meantime, uh, we're going to get a lot of experience and bruises from elbows as we all try to do this at the same time. Thank you. Um, the next question um, is about making the PRO as a kind of essential for patient-specific recommendation as part of the shared decision-making. So you all talk about it's important to incorporate or integrate that into the workflow. So in terms of um, data visualization, what ideas do you have to make the data or in a way that uh, render the insights for the clinicians and uh, patients quickly and in an actionable form? I, this is Deb. I, I think that will vary depending on the, the data. Um, and I'd be really interested to, to know what Ida thinks about some of her applications and, and, and be interested in hearing Leslie talk about intimate partner violence. Um, for something like hemoglobin A1C or, or blood pressure readings, um, I think there's work to be done around user-centered design when it comes to data visualization and, and to keep in mind that there are different kinds of users. Um, clinicians and patients should be able to, to use this. Um, the visualization tools that, that I've seen seem to have um, be very clear and simple in design. They have run charts. They show data over, over time. Um, but understanding what the right intervals are, understanding what data are most meaningful to plot over time in the visualization tool takes, takes some iterative um, design with potential users. I will say one of the things to, to think about that may not be on, on the radar um, as much in, in the asking of this question is that when you start using a visualization tool, there are some considera considerations for how the examination room is set up, if that's the environment in which it's going to be used. We, we noticed oftentimes that, um, you know, the monitor wasn't visible to the patient, the patient was sitting halfway across the room, you know, so despite the clinician's best efforts to point to something on the screen, the patient was too far away and never invited in. So, so there's, a, there's a lot of interesting things to, to consider to make this really usable at the point of, of, of care. Um, and, and thinking about the circumstances and situations where that's the case um, makes sense. This is also just an opportunity to quickly loop back to Ida's really important point, which is one of the recommendations we make in the practical guide is to look at where you're already collecting patient-generated health data and, and, and start there if there's a potential um, way of making it better by automating it. And I will say in our, we've got a paper coming out on this, the, the journals that some of our patients shared were not all that tidy and easy to process. Um, but so there's some variability in how folks write these things down, but blood pressure was certainly something that patients were already sharing. The, the more I do this, um, the more I, I um, think that um, the word visualization, I think, you know, almost automatically pulls us into thinking about graphical presentations. And I think we've seen from uh, the COVID uh, issues that we've been facing that, you know, lots of people are not all that numerate. Uh, and that graph literacy is something that we can't take for granted. Um, and yet we all know stories, we communicate in stories, stories are far, far more powerful. And um, in some of our earlier design work on the Improve app, for example, we went through lots and lots of different kinds of graphs. And it turned out what people wanted was a sentence. They just wanted a sentence. It says, you know, you're better now than you were, but you had a big dip, you know, three months ago. 
Um, and, and, and actually, that's the message that you cognitively are processing when you're looking at a graph. So why are we spending all our time putting things out in graph form so that people can extract that message when really maybe we should just tell them in a sentence that we can all read and we can like customize that sentence in the patient's own language at their literacy levels. Um, you know, there's all sorts of auto summarization out there. Uh, I, I think we need to be thinking complementary about graphical methods so people can explore time trends or whatever if they if they you know have those skills. Uh, but you know, even even as a clinician, right? Um, I don't really want a complicated graph that I need to think through during a visit. I might just want a really really nice summary, just like I'm curbsiding a uh, a fellow clinician who is just super precise. Right, and just tells me in three sentences what I need to know. And then if I want to go back to the graph, I can. But, but maybe we should be thinking about you know getting away from just visualization, but also summarization as a complement. So the um, there's perhaps no area where shared decision making is as important as intimate partner violence, because um, actions in that area trigger you know. Uh, both protect the patient, but can trigger violence and uh, end relationships and uh, upend lives, uh, as well as the need to ensure the safety of children exposed to that. Uh, so this really does have to be a shared decision. So in this setting, what we try to do is to prevent, present as clear and as concise a summary of the risks as we can, and then to guide the physician through a, an informed assessment of uh, the actual risk and what the best uh, strategy is to mitigate that. And then um, allow them to document that and the time that they have in the in a shared decision making approach. Uh, this is clearly not something that uh, is easy to do. Um, with our um, but it's very important that this be a shared activity and that the the data here not dominate the discussion and uh, uh, of values and the risks and benefits that patients are willing to uh, embrace. With COVID-19, it's a very similar discussion. It's like, uh, is your symptoms declining enough so that you need an emergency room visit? So uh, here again, you're going to the, you know, the nurse's job is not so much to, to say, have your symptoms gotten worse? The patient will know whether they're gotten worse. It's, the question is, is the environment adequate to manage the person if it continues to decline a little bit? Is it, uh, um, can this go on? Or does it, is this a point where we have to intervene now? And again, that's a shared decision because our application was designed and is used heavily in rural areas of South uh, Carolina where getting in to see the doctor might be a very difficult task. So particularly, um, you know, given how overburdened emergency rooms and other things are. So the decision to visit a health provider is has to be a shared decision as well. So these are these are difficult. And I, I just would really second the uh, um, the issues about graphs and other things as uh, being difficult to potentially explain to patients. I'd, I'd add that the graphs have to cover the dimensions that are important to patients and not just to the ones to the healthcare professional. I may care a lot about my blood pressure control, but I may care more about the number of times I stood up and was dizzy. And that, uh, um, whereas my doctor may not think that the number of times I got dizzy standing up too fast was really that important to me, uh, or that it should be that important in the long run. You can always get up slower or less. Anyway, so I, the, the issues about getting doctors and patients to agree on values uh, so that uh, uh, patient-generated health care data can be more effective at the point of care in changing behaviors and in linking particularly the data to um, evidence-based interventions uh, uh, to change behaviors, I think is really critical. And we're just at the beginning of that era uh, where these data come back in and maybe in sentence form, it's not so much on what's happened, but the, the, the guidance has to be what to do next with the data uh, and uh, how to do that in a way that is truly a shared decision with the patients. We have a little of that in our IPV application. I'd like to see more of that in some of the other PGD uh, applications going forward. Thank you. My next question is um, about the concerns um, about practice issues or liabilities. So I think a lot of providers, they are wondering like once data comes into their EHR system, it's maybe their 
responsibility to act upon those. And then so if some alert comes in midnight and then they happen to miss that, and how do you address that? So I would like to get your thoughts on this liability issues and how to address that. I guess I could uh, start off with that one. Um, for our project, we specifically did not ask the question about societal ideation uh, when we were assessing um, depression because of the of the um, uh, the legal concerns and you know it's a it's a research study so we don't have the whole staffing behind it and it was not something that we felt we could uh, impose on the on the care on the care staff. Um, the the blood pressure data, you know, as it comes in, we because we already have patients who are emailing us, the health center had already established sort of this, you know, thing of your doc will be looking at this data within the next, you know, day to three days, and if it's emergency, don't blah blah blah. So the 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 health system already worked through this framework for liability of of, of patient messages to us, and so we just sort of slipped in, uh, slipped in under, under that one um, was how we, we handled it, uh, you know, by talking to the, to the legal, legal people in, in the health system. We definitely did not roll our own. We just figured out what was allowable uh, and, and then came, came under that one and didn't, didn't go beyond that. Well, EHR reintegration is critical here, right? And that uh, so that you can have a workflow where someone gets the alert as to the change as to what's going on in their uh, the health of a particular patient. That's uh, that's just a part of the process. And we definitely did that with our um, uh, monitoring of patients at home with COVID-19. Uh, once the data are reintegrated, then you can not only, you can use the uh, um, alerting mechanisms of EHRs to then trigger an appropriate workflow. Uh, Hard to do in a primary care setting, though, where you have an acute event happening, and you know, a nine to five staff or not, uh, you know, a nine to seven staff uh, for that. And so you really have to think about, as you say, the data that you're collecting and how to, if it's a an answer that's needed in two hours or an hour or ten minutes, then you need to have a workflow that does that, and that uh, um, that really does make EHR integration of patient generated health data not optional in a lot of cases. Deb, would you have anything to add? I don't. Our next question is about, um, have you run into legal concerns facing treatment recommendation on home monitoring or integrating data collected using a variety of novel health apps or wearables that potentially don't fully don't have full FDA approval. I could probably take that one to start with and say that uh, um, experiments uh, require human subjects approval, and that would be new devices and other things that haven't had FDA approval have to be done under uh, a uh, IRB approved uh, mechanism. Uh, as for you know, you know, the, when you're in a field of flowers and and patients can use anything they want. Uh, I'm not sure I believe in that. I really do like the idea of prescribing apps and uh, prescribing uh, inter uh, monitoring sequences of questionnaires uh, to generate data as best as possible to, so that it fits in with the right medical context and then I know how to bring that back into my workflows. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. And the next question is, um, so do you have any I guess experience with patients that you would like to collect their patient generated health data, but they cannot afford the digital device or they don't have or they have limited access to Wi-Fi. And so there are some barriers that faced by the patients. And so how do you do for those patients? Yeah, it's a great question. I we did hear about some of that. Um, our partner OCHIN is a, a network of federally qualified health centers and they some of their organizations in it, at least in COVID responses had to have partnerships with organizations and, and funding to, to help overcome some of those health equity barriers. 
some practices will, you know, maintain a supply of blood pressure cuffs. Um, others will, um, you know, be advocating for purchasing equipment for patients. But this is a, a really important thing to, to think about. And, um, and it's it, because it can create more inequities if it's not addressed early on. And there, there are some opportunities to, to partnership with community organizations to support equipment acquisition um, and other kinds of, of things that, that patients may need to be able to take advantage of this kind of um, data collection. And, and not just to... Go ahead, Ida, if you want to. Yeah, and not, not just to... to um, Get the device, um, but the, it's the support uh, and the um, and the and the training, um, and that the devices that are purchased should be ones that are uh, the most user friendly, which sometimes is not the cheapest one. Uh, we've run into that when you're trying to optimize different things. Um, I think there's also a movement to use. Um, it is it's a general trend to sort of go away from the Bluetooth pairing, which is really, really challenging. Because, you know, you set somebody up with their device and their phone and it's all paired, and then next week, you know, it breaks, right? And then, well, then who do they call? Uh, that's, that's not easy to have that support mechanism. I think that right now, that's a, that's a big crack that people are falling through. Um, but I think, you know, moving towards maybe sensors that are, are cellular based, which would be far easier. Uh, so I think there's a tremendous amount of work to be done there. In rural areas, we give out access points to people who don't have internet at home, who have chronic illnesses. That uh, that's part of our telehealth, state telehealth center. So uh, that may be the only solution is to do a cellular to uh, Wi-Fi router uh, that you just give people uh, for the duration of their illness. Uh, I agree that the Bluetooth stuff is uh, difficult to do, and that's why we like deep linkages and ordering devices that if you can prescribe the device, you have a limited, of course, you have to figure out how to pay for it, but now you you're not have to, don't have to make it work with every possible device. And then you can use the specifications of the device in configuring your app. So those types of, uh, at this point, we're still at a level where uh, deep knowledge uh, and share of the, uh, everything's deep to me. Um, I'm over my head. So, uh, but uh, uh, deep linkages, uh, uh, allow us to, to configure apps to speak to specific devices with, um, you know, some precision and then to do reinstalls and offer user support and those types of things there. So um, I think, yeah, the, the, it's, it's really tough, though, because patients can install anything on their phone and it will break it eventually. So some of the time you'll probably want to give them a dedicated phone as well for it's really a crucial link. Well, so, so just to jump in, um, Ida, you made a really important Point, there's an interesting tension here between what we do in the context of a research study and what's going to need to be done in the real world. And all of the training that may be part of supporting patients to participate in a research study to use an app is absolutely going to need to be done in the real world too. That is not going to go away. So building that into the reality of implementation and support um, becomes something I think um, actual implementers are, are going to need to pay attention to. And when we write about this in our publications, we need to recognize that's not a feature of the study. That's actually a feature of implementation. We have reached the end of our time for this webinar. Thank you for attending. For those interested in obtaining continuing education credit for participating in this webinar, please visit the URL shown on this slide. You will have 14 days to claim your CE. Upon exiting today's webinar, HRQ is also fielding a brief evaluation, and we hope that you will complete this survey to share your feedback with us. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.